Just quick uh, testimony. Um, my name is Jim Rickard, and I have a wonderful ministry of stewardship to pastors and missionaries. It started uh, about 30 years ago. I gave a little bit of this morning, just a little bit of brief deal, but it started in Cedarville back in the 1960s. Did my pastor's tax return in 1969. I loved to do tax returns at the time. I graduated in business and accounting at the University of Toledo and then finished at Cedarville. And I didn't know how to do this, I didn't know how to do his return, so I jumped into that arena and began to research it, and the word got out that this Rickard guy does taxes, so I began to get undated with taxes from pastors and came out here in 73, 74 really, January, and I spoke at that pastor's conference in 75. And those guys asked me questions for three and a half hours. There was 400 pastors there about the issue of tax. That's where I really realized how great the need was. 77, I spoke at a church in Walla Walla, Washington, and a businessman took me out to dinner after the morning, Sunday morning service and said, uh, why don't you do this full time and my companies will sponsor you and let's see what God does with it. So we moved to the northwestern part of the country near Seattle, about 200 miles east, Tri-Cities, and kept it there 10 years. We don't ever promote it. You've never seen any advertisements in any publications and you never will. We do not have a website because we would be inundated uh, by pastors that frankly we have no interest in being involved with. I'm talking about the liberal segment and all that and uh, I, I get a lot of requests from that group and I have no interest there. I'm only, as I told the Shepherds Conference guys, I'm only interested in helping pastors that believe what's taught from Grace Community Church's pulpit. That's where we're at theologically and so we really, really protect that. So that's why you'll never see it advertised. But this thing is for you guys. That's why we do what we do. I have uh, 11 businessmen who fund this ministry. Uh, John uh, is on my board, been involved in my ministry for a number of years as I am his. And uh, so that, that, that gives it a lot of uh, credibility, frankly. When a pastor calls me to speak in his church, if I don't know who he is or what his church is all about, and I exchange questions and I, and with him and I can't get clear answers, and I will say, well, sometimes we know people by their associations. And uh, what, uh, what do you think of the ministry of uh, John MacArthur from Grace Community Church? And that tells you volumes. And uh, so that's a real help to my ministry. And so, so that's, that's mainly why I do that. Of course, he's a friend as well. But, but the tax side is what it's all about. And guys, you're going to be walking the aisle one of these days, and you're going to get that sheepskin, and you're going to pastor a church or go to the mission field or whatever, and part of your life is going to be the financial arena. And uh, Matthew chapter 6 is my favorite text, treasures on earth, treasures in heaven, you can't serve two masters, and then Matthew 6, 21, where you put your money is where your heart is, is why I've given my life to this, to teach God's people the issue of stewardship. Not much taught here from the pulpit. Uh, I'll be in a church, I'm usually in a church somewhere almost every Sunday in the country, and it's not uncommon for me to speak at a church and after the, after the morning service on Sunday have guys come up to me or people come up to me and say to me, I've, uh, I've been in this church for 20 years and I've never heard a message on stewardship. So there's two reasons for that. One is it's a sensitive subject, but it is part of the whole counsel of God and needs to be taught. Second reason is a lot of pastors aren't, aren't paid adequately so they can model stewardship. And if a pastor cannot model stewardship, he probably will never teach it because that would be hypocritical. What, what I teach, my wife and I have lived for 39 years of marriage. When we were engaged, we put a financial plan together for our marriage. And that financial plan became the plan for our marriage. And we have lived it all these years. I tell people every week, probably somewhere, my wife and I have been married 39 years. We were engaged for two years. We have never had words over money, not one time. And it's because we understand what money does and how it affects our life. We always know what our budget is. We always know what our cash flow is. Cash is king. You'll hear that from financial people. Cash is king. I don't care if it's a business, if it's a church, if it's a family. Cash is king. If you have positive cash flow, you're able to do what God would have you do and do what you want to do. And if you struggle there, you're probably going to spill over in other areas of your life. And so I counsel boards. I do leadership seminars at churches. And one thing I tell these church leaders, be generous with your shepherd. Be generous with your pastor. Make sure that he can model stewardship. You don't ever put a pastor in a position where he cannot pay his bills, where he cannot take care of the needs of his family. And the one handout you have there, and some of this I'm going to have to go over really quickly, is the finance seminar. I just wanted to put that in your hands. But this is the summary of how to handle money. Is not, money, money is not a mystery. 
And handling money and being a good steward is not rocket science. It's discipline. And the Christian walk is a disciplined walk. Don't say to me, I'm faithful to the Word of God. I'm faithful in my studies. I'm faithful in my devotions. But I'm out of control financially. But I do have it together. Baloney. Baloney. It's a, your life is a package, guys. And you're going to get out of here, and you're going to pastor a church, many of you, someday, and you're going to rub shoulders with very successful businessmen. You can't live like they live. You can't drive the cars they drive. You can't live in the homes they live in. You can't take the trips that they take. That's just not where you're at financially. You've got to be careful that you don't ever let that rub off on you. You've got to protect yourself and guard yourself that your attitude and your materialistic tendencies, and we all have it, don't buy into that because if it does, if it does, it could undermine your ability to minister. And so these four issues here boils down to four issues. Be generous. Be generous. I've uh, I teach the three convictions of biblical stewardship when I preach at a church the first time. And number one is be is be generous. First Corinthians 16, Second Corinthians 9. Number two, be content. First Timothy 6. Number three, be a person of integrity. And then you take those three convictions and send them and, 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 and ground them in the lives of God's people. And then you, you teach the 14 key principles of how you live it. And so I do that in Sunday school or sometimes Sunday night. Here's the three convictions. This is what your conviction should be about when it comes to stewardship. Now let's see how you live it. That's the 14 key principles. But it boils down to these right here. Number one, be generous. Number two, take care of the needs of your family. Number three, protect your family from a catastrophic occurrence. That's disability and, and a premature death. And number four, plan for the future. That's retirement planning and that's financial. That's, that's estate planning. Now, if credit cards control your life, if you allow credit cards to control your life, which many people in this country do, you can't do any of these. You can't do any of these. And that's why you don't ever get yourself in a position, particularly in the ministry, where money controls your life. Guys, I want to tell you something. As I've already said, I've done this for 25 years. I know of more pastors, many more pastors, who have defaulted out of the ministry because of financial indiscretion than moral indiscretion. And there's a lot of guys that have defaulted morally. I know more who have defaulted financially. So it's an issue that you just don't ignore. And it's an issue that you make sure you understand the basics about being a good steward and that you focus on that at least as part, that part of your life so that you don't ever compromise yourself financially. And, this, and, and, if, and, if, and if you allow credit cards to control your life, uh, it'll eventually turn you upside down. And you can't do any of these when that happens. You can't be generous. You can't take care of the needs of your family. You can't protect your family from a catastrophic occurrence. And you can't provide for the future because credit cards control your life. So you don't allow that, you don't allow that to happen. Now, if you're at this uh, seminary, you'll have opportunity to be involved in our mailing list if you want to do that. I need your email to do that. Um, and every year we send out the tax booklet. I think you guys, all guys should have gotten one uh, sometime in November or December. And in that booklet is how we do the pastor's taxes in the middle of some green tear-out sheets. You just fill those things out and either mail them to us or bring them to our office and we'll do your federal and state tax returns for you. And you guys that, that, are, that are new this year and come from other states, you're gonna probably have a part year state in two different states. We do all that. We have all the forms, we do all of that. Uh, most of it's computerized. We do tax returns from all 50 states for pastors. We just do pastors. This year we'll probably hit 1,800. We probably help between uh, seven and 10,000 pastors across the country with our counseling and so on. But this is how we do the tax returns through this booklet. And it's important to us that you fill out those green sheets because there's very, very important questions that we need to know the answers to before we can do your tax return accurately. A lot of credits this year, guys. A lot of changes took place on, for involving last year's tax returns. I will guarantee you pastors who have their tax returns done by a, by a, by a preparer who doesn't know ministers, or they do them, themselves, do them themselves, if we get 100 of them next year, I'll guarantee you 90 of them were wrong. And they probably missed refunds that they were entitled to because that's how most of the tax credits work this year, tremendous refunds. There's pastors this year that I've done taxes for that, that are expecting to owe four or 500 bucks so they're getting three, $4,000 back because of the child tax credits, because of the earned income credits, because of the way the rules have changed for 2002 particularly. And so there's a lot of benefits that you need to be aware of. You want to take advantage of it. You don't want to give a dime more 
to Uncle Sam than you should because of, of, of taxes. And so it's important that you stay up on that. If you're on our mailing list, you'll get the booklet. If you're on, we have your email address. You'll get, uh, um, we're going to do bulletins four times a year to keep you up to date on the tax law changes. You'll see these are two of the bulletins are colored. And obviously, I don't have a colored copier. But one was for October and one was for December. One will come out in April after the tax season's done. And you get that automatically on your email if we have your email address. Like I said, guys, there's no, pri there's no charge. You can't beat the cost. It's as cheap as it gets. I want to cover the tax for the rest of the time that we're together. So take this handout called Pastor's Tax Seminar, and let me, let me go through that with you. Yes? Um, do you have to be like a pastor of a church, or do you be just a student involved in the For you guys to take advantage of the tax preparation service that we offer, you do not have to be pastoring a church. As long as you're attending the seminary, we, we make that available to you. I made it available to the, to the Shepherds Conference, which I, I, I'll speak at probably attend pastor's conferences this year. I only offer it to two or three because we just can't handle it. Shepherds is one of them. You guys at the seminary are another group that we are more than willing to do your taxes. So don't be afraid to do that. If you're a foreign student, we do taxes. If you're earning money in this country uh, and you're a foreign student, you have tax responsibilities here. We'll do those for you too. Yes? If you're a foreign student, you're not working. Your wife is working. Yeah, if your wife is working here in the United States, yeah, you got to file a United States tax return. We'll do that for you. Sure. Taxes. Guys, let me get through it to this. If I can hit this. You guys are dual status taxpayers when you become a pastor or a missionary. That, that's, what, that's, that's what categorizes you. Your dual status. That means you're an employee for income tax. You are self-employed for Social Security and Medicare tax. It's called the self-employment tax. And, and when you talk about self-employment tax, it's not FICA, it's SICA. So when you see that term, that means you're a dual status taxpayer. And that's what you are. You're the only taxpayer in the country that's like this. Only pastors and missionaries. When you're dual status, you're eligible for some particular tax law issues like the housing allowance. Whatever it costs you to live in a home is tax-free for income tax purposes. But it's subject to the self-employment tax. I'm amazed at how many tax returns we'll get. We just got one uh, yesterday where a pastor had it prepared by a CPA for a number of years and he never added back the housing allowance for self-employment tax purposes. So we amended the last three years. It's going to cost the guy about 28,000 bucks plus interest and penalties because the CPA doesn't know what he's doing. So I, I say that to you because you've got to be aware of some of this stuff. You don't want to be caught there. You, you, there's some obvious glaring issues with your tax return that there's no excuse that you're not aware of them when you have the opportunity to sit in a seminar like this or you get the tax book that's very clear so that, that's, that's, that's the starting point. That's what makes you very, very unique. Now take your handouts and look at page two. It's, the bottom says page two. Here's what your W-2 would look like. At the, bottom, at the top of the W-2 is a, sa a sample salary package. Base salary of 24-6. This church helps the pastor pay his self-employment tax. Now, if you're an employee, other than a church situation, you work for a warehouse or whatever, as you know, they withhold 7.65 from your wages, and then they have to match it, your corporation, when they send in the 15.3 to the Social Security Administration or the IRS for your self-employment taxes. You as a pastor, when you're SICA, when you're dual status, you have to pay the whole 15.3. That's how it works for you. So when I talk to a church board, I'll say to this board, hey, listen, guys, if your pastor was a normal taxpayer, you would have to pay 7.65 of his wages into the Social Security system. You would have to do that. Now, you're not required to do that for the pastor because he has to pay the whole 15.3. But why not give him the 7.65 as additional income to help him pay the 15.3? And I'll say if you're willing, and I've never had a church refuse to do that. They don't do it because they're not aware of it. They've never been taught. 
So I'll say to them, if you're going to pick up this 7.65 and give it to him as additional taxable income, it's like a bonus, do it at 9.8%. Because he has to pay tax on that. And if he pays tax on that, it'll net out to the 7.65. Now you've really helped him. That's what that second entry is in that salary package. That $2,900 is that 7.65, really about 9.8, that the church is picking up for this pastor to help him pay his self-employment tax. The $14,500 is his housing allowance. This guy's buying his own home. And he has $14,500 in expenses to maintain that house. And I'll show you the details of that in just a bit. The church provides this guy a medical insurance policy. And so they pay the premiums from the church. That's a tax-free fringe benefit. You can see there, it's taxable. It's, it's not taxable. Doesn't include it in the W-2. You can see it there, the 4200 The 300 the church buys this guy some group term life insurance. I'll say to a board, hey, listen, guys, what would happen if this pastor of yours uh, became disabled? Now, what happens if he dies prematurely, gets cancer, gets killed in an accident? Do you have a moral obligation to his family? Of course they do. And they feel that. And I'll say, fine, protect the family and protect the church. Buy your pastor a life insurance policy with his wife as beneficiary. Uh, buy a disability policy for him so that if he becomes disabled, the church doesn't have to continue paying his salary. The disability insurance will pay his salary. Well, that's what those two are. Group term life insurance. In this case, it's about 300 bucks. Life insurance is cheap when you get term. You know, when you're, when you're under 40, 45, 50 years of age, it's, 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 it's cheap. Guys, you want to buy life insurance, I would recommend term insurance for you. Don't, you don't need to buy whole life or universal life insurance. Buy term insurance. Why? It's cheaper. The coverage is a lot better for the money. You can renew it automatically. And if you put the extra money into a pension plan, don't buy whole life and, and uh, universal life insurance. You don't need to do that. Uh, retirement plan, a 403B. That's a pension plan. That's a nonprofit pension plan. Guys, look at this. 403B pension plans have some tremendous characteristics. Makes them very unique. They're not like 401Ks. They're not like SEP IRAs or Roth IRAs. If you've ever written any of my articles that I write for any publications, I'll make a comment in there. Pastors should not be in IRAs or Roth IRAs. Here's why. The 403-B pension plan is a nonprofit pension plan. It's equivalent to a for-profit 401k, although it's non-profit. There are two distinct characteristics with a 403b pension plan. It can be salary reduction. You can say, I want to put a couple thousand bucks a year into the 403b pension plan. The church writes the check to the whoever's going to handle the pension plan. It can be from salary reduction. You reduce your salary and do it. Or the church can do it in addition to salary. Here's the two characteristics. Characteristic number one, you never pay self-employment tax on 403B pension plans. You don't pay it on when it goes in, you don't pay it when you take it out someday. It's exempt from the self-employment tax. Characteristic number two, when you retire someday from the ministry, well you say I'm not going to retire. Well you don't know that. You may get into your 60s or 70s and end up like Dr. Duncan. He's got a nerve disease. He can't pastor anymore. You may have to retire. Well when you start taking distributions out of the 403B pension plan, you're not pastoring anymore. You're not getting any income from a church anymore. You're just getting income to live on from your pension plan. You can apply housing allowance to this, even though you're not pastoring anymore. So you can take it out tax-free. Guys will say to me, well, I want to get into a Roth IRA, an R-O-T-H, a Roth. Advantage of the Roth is you pay tax on the money you put into it. It's tax-free when you take it out, even when it grows from investment returns. It comes out tax-free. Well, let's say you want to put $4,000 into a Roth pension plan. And let's say you're paying a 15.3% self-employment tax. And let's say your income tax is 15%. You're paying 30% tax on that Roth. So you're paying $1,200 to the government to put $4,000 into the Roth. I say to pastors, why don't you put the $5,200 into the 403B pension plan? Because the end result's the same. You're never going to pay the self-employment tax on it. You never pay that on it. And if you take it out as housing allowance, you'll never pay that on it. What would you rather have working for you for the next 20, 30, 40 years? $4,000 in your pension plan or $5,200 in your pension plan? It becomes a no-brainer. And so you do the 403B pension plan. Remember, the last one there is a professional reimbursement fund. 
I tell boards, guys, you call this pastor to be involved in the lives of your people. It's going to cost something to do that. They're called professional expenses. Then I'll say to the board, listen, those are not the pastor's professional expenses. Those are the church's professional expenses. Because that's what costs the church for this guy to be involved in the lives of your people. Mileage on his car, business mileage, entertainment that he does, books and periodicals that he buys, conferences that he goes to should be reimbursed by the church totally separate from a salary package. Well, that's the configuration. Now look at the W-2 down below. Now, from the medical insurance on down, those are all non-taxable fringe benefits. They're all tax-free, not subject to any taxes. The first three items in that list are taxable for either income tax, self-employment tax, or in some cases, both. This guy's salary is $24,600, plus he gets $2,900 that the church gives him to help him pay his self-employment tax. So this guy makes $27,500 in base salary. That's twenty-seven five. dollars You see that in block one of the W-2. Now he gets a $14,500 housing allowance. He's paid this $14,500, but it's housing allowance. He spends it on housing, which makes it tax-free for income tax. That goes in block 14. That's the minister's housing allowance, $14,500. In block 12A, that letter E is your 403B pension plan. That's where that $2,000 goes. That's how you do a W-2 for a pastor. And when a W-2 is done this way, the taxes are prepared but by the tax preparer, understanding what's going on here because a W-2 is correct. So that's, how, that's the starting point. Page 3 is how the house, housing allowance works. Now, because you're a minister you are eligible for the tax-free housing allowance. Whatever it costs you to maintain a home is not subject to federal or state income taxes unless you're pastoring in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, the housing allowance is added back for, for state income tax purposes. Look at the middle of the page. Who qualifies for a housing allowance exclusion? Number one, to qualify a minister above number one, to qualify a minister or religious worker must be duly ordained Commission or license and authorized to perform duties of a minister of the gospel. Number one, the board votes the allowance prior to the first pay period of the year in question. Housing allowance is never retroactive. It's always forward thinking. So I tell churches, your housing allowance should be voted on by your board, preferably December 31st of the preceding year. Then it's all taken care of. It needs to be done before you get your first paycheck in the following year. Number two, you always overestimate the allowance. If you say, I'm going to spend, if I'm, if I, let's say you make $40,000 a year. And you say, OK, of my $40,000, uh, 20000 is housing allowance. Well, if you think, I'm going to, I know I'll spend fifteen on my house, I could spend eighteen. Say twenty. You always want to go too high in case something happens. You spend money you didn't foresee, and you lose it as a housing allowance. If you only voted a $15,000 housing allowance, you spend 20, you lost that 5,000 as a deduction from income tax. You don't want to do that. You always want to estimate high. Then at the end of the year, you add up all your receipts <coughs> that you spent on the house, and if your housing allowance is 20,000, which means your W-2 only reflected the, the second 20, the 40 from the 20 is 20. And then if you only use, say, 15 of the 20, you declare the 5,000 of, of unused housing allowance on line 21 of your 1040 tax return as unused housing allowance. Every time we do a tax return at the office, if the pastor doesn't have an entry on line 21 as unused housing allowance, his housing allowance is probably too low. He's probably not doing it quite right. So we always look for that. Number three, you can amend the allowance during the year, but never retroactively. So if you come to, say, uh, May 1st of the year, and your housing allowance has been approved by the board, and you're just humming along during the year, and something happens to your house, a furniture purchase, or a, a roof fails, and you've got to re re replace the roof, or you've re got to buy a new furnace, and it's not in the original number that was approved, before you write the check to pay for that, you have the board amend your housing allowance, and up it. And then that, that expenditure is covered. That's how you do that. Uh, number four, you want to keep accurate records. Records is the issue. If you're ever audited for housing allowance, it's going to be by the IRS. And I tell pastors, have a, have a manila folder. During the course of the year, anytime you buy something for the house, throw the receipt into that folder or the canceled check, so at the end of the year, all the receipts of stuff that you bought for that house is reflected in that folder. 
Now look at the bottom. What does the parsonage allowance exclusion include? There are five categories. Guys, there was a case a couple years ago called the Warren case. Pastor by the name Rick Warren, he's out here, was audited by the IRS for housing allowance. The IRS rejected part of his housing allowance. The IRS said it was too high. Warren went out and hired an attorney, a very aggressive, sharp attorney. He challenged it in tax court. He won the case. The tax court f threw out any maximum number on housing allowance. So prior to three years ago, the case was settled on December 31st of 2001. Prior to three years ago, there was a limit on the housing allowance, how much you could deduct as housing allowance. Tax court came in on that case and threw out the limit. So what the tax court said, there is no limit on housing allowance. Whatever you spend on a house is housing allowance. Well, that's very problematic because I could show you how you would never ever pay income tax again, federal or state. Even if you have a huge salary, I could tell you, I could show you how to do it. So we knew that rule wasn't gonna stand. IRS appealed it to the appellate court. IRS won the case. So as of January 1st, 2002, the rules went back to the old rules, which is fair market rental value, including furnishings. So the regs say the maximum amount of housing allowance you can take has got to be based on the fair market rental value of your home, including furnishings. Now there's a problem with that. So the tax court said, hey listen, IRS, go back and redefine the rules. Well as of now, they still have not done that. Twelve years ago, I defined housing allowance and I submitted our definition to the Internal Revenue Service. They accepted our definition. As far as I know, we have never had a housing allowance audited that used our definition that got into trouble. This definition is right here, bottom of page three. We call it five different categories. That's how we, that's how we define it. The first category is the most important. The first category has a limit on how much housing allowance you can take. It's rent, if you pay rent, that's pretty simple to establish that. Purchase of a home, or major improvements in that home, not to exceed the fair market rental value. Fair market rental value costs included in this category are down payment, legal fees, mortgage payments, interest, taxes, and insurance. I call it P-I-T-I-I, -I, principal, interest, taxes, insurance, and improvements. That, those items in category number one is limited to fair market rental value. Now at the bottom of the page, it defined fair market rental value. Fair market rental value varies by location by house. A general rule of thumb is 1% of appraised value per month. Example, if the appraisal of your house is $100,000, you live in a $100,000 home, the fair market rental value would be $1,000 or 1% 1 per month. The annual fair market rental value would be 1,000 times 12 months or $12,000. So the most you could spend if you, if you live in a $100,000 home for category number one would be $12,000. Now, category number two is all furnishings. There's no limit to that, whatever you spend on it. Category number three is utilities, whatever you spend on utilities. Category number four is cleaning supplies. Category number five are miscellaneous repairs. So when you look at what you're able to deduct for housing allowance, it's very broad. Bottom line, guys, it's everything you spend in that house except for food and personal care items like toothpaste, toilet tissue. Those are not housing allowance. Soap that you buy to wash yourself is personal. Soap that you buy to clean the house is housing allowance. Car a carpet, throw rugs, pictures, uh, kitchen utensils, tools for the garage, uh, all that stuff is housing allowance. Bedspreads, pillowcases, washcloths, all that stuff is housing allowance. Everything but personal care items like toothpaste, toilet tissue, or food, food is not housing law. So it's a very broad issue, very broad category. Yes, sir? That down payment, that counts, so if you put a $20,000 down payment on a house, you count that plus the market? Down payment has to fit in category number one. So it has to fit that fair market rental value definition. So it has, to fit within it. has to fit within that. That's why I tell pastors, if you're going to buy a house, don't buy it in November or December. Buy it in January because you get the whole year to absorb that down payment. And ch chances are you'll never absorb, you won't absorb much of it, but you will absorb some of it because of the definition. 
So it's important to understand when you buy a house and when you don't buy a house. Now, some of you guys are going to live in church-owned parsonages. You have a double-headed housing allowance, which gets a little confusing. Uh, look at page four. You get a double-headed housing allowance. Let's say a church calls you to pastor it, and they give you a home to live in. So you're going to live in the church-owned parsonage. And let's say, for illustrative purposes, they're going to give you $25,000 a year in cash. That's your cash. That's how much they're going to pay you in cash. And they say, we're going to give you this house to live in. Well, the house has a fair market rental value of, say, 1000 a month. It's a parsonage, say, next to the church. So that has an annual value for the parsonage. You don't get this money. You're living in a house that has a $1,000 a month value. $12,000 a year. So let's say uh, the church pays the utilities. Let's say that amounts to $2,000 a year. So this is the utilities. This is the fair market rental value of the parsonage. They're paying you $25,000 in cash. IRS says you make $39,000. That's what the IRS tax law says. Now let's say, because you're living in this parsonage, you're going to spend some money out of the $25,000 to maintain that parsonage. You're going to buy a living room suit, bedroom suit. Uh, maybe you pay for some utilities, cable TV, whatever. And let's say out of your pocket, you spend $2,000. Well, let's make it so it doesn't get confusing. Let's say you spend $4,000 out of your $25,000 of your money to maintain that church-owned parsonage. Now, let's put that in the minutes, top of page four. This is the minutes that votes the housing and parsonage allowance. Look at the second paragraph. The parsonage owned by the church has a rental value of how much for the year? $12,000. And it's provided for the convenience of the church. Annual utility expenses will be paid by the church, and they will amount to approximately what? $2,000 a year. Now, the minute the board takes this action, this $12,000 and this $2,000 is exempt from income tax, federal and state income tax. If the board doesn't take this action, you would have to pay income tax at the starting point of $39,000. So just that action right there exempts 14,000 bucks from federal income tax. Now look at the third paragraph. After considering the statement, pastor's estimate of home expenses, that's in our booklet, prepared by pastor so-and-so, a motion was made and seconded and passed to adopt the following resolution. We're resolved that pastor so-and-so is to receive a total cash remuneration of what? How much this guy paid? 25,000. For the year, say 2003, of this amount, 4,000 is hereby considered as parsonage allowance. Now, follow me. Let's see if you followed me. This guy makes 25,000 cash, that's what he's paid, lives in a parsonage, church pays the utilities. Out of his 25,000, he's going to pay $4,000 for housing allowance out of his pocket. Block one of the W-2, you don't ever put housing allowance. You just put the cash salary after housing allowance. What does his W-2 block one say? That's right, 21,000. If you put the housing allowance in block 14, which I recommend you put it in there, what would the number be in block 14 for housing allowance? It would be, yeah, it would be 4 plus 12 plus 2 would be in block 14, would be 18,000. Where does his income tax start? On what number? 21,000. What does he pay the self-employment tax on? 39,000. Because you have to pay self-employment tax on parsonage allowance. Now, if this guy's buying a home and he has a $14,000 housing allowance, that second paragraph would be omitted because it's not a church-owned parsonage. That's how you do that. That's how you do it tax-wise. And then when a tax preparer who's doing your taxes gets your W-2 that it reflects it like this, he knows exactly, if he understands ministers, he knows exactly what's happened. Look at page five. Professional expenses. Guys, IRS looks at you guys as businessmen. They look at your congregation as your customers. So you have a business relationship recognized by the Internal Revenue Service. Guys, if I lived in your town where you're pastoring and I had a factory that makes widgets and you guys bought my widgets, you're my customers. Whatever I do with you has a business relationship. 
And whatever I spend with you can be deducted or reimbursed to me by my company for business expenses. Same with your church. Whatever you pastors do with your congregation is a legitimate business expense recognized by the Internal Revenue Service. Now I tell pastors, sit down with your boards and make sure that they have a full understanding and you have a full understanding as what is reimbursable. Because let me tell you how far it goes. Let's say I'm a member of your church. And let's say, um, let's say um, my daughter, or this, uh, the, the, this deacon's daughter is getting married. And you're not performing in a ceremony. This deacon's daughter is getting married at your church. And I'm also a member of that church. And I don't go to the wedding. And I don't buy a gift for that, for that deacon's daughter, a wedding gift. Big whoop. If he's offended, he'll get over it. You, the pastor, don't go. It's an issue. It's an issue. So the IRS would recognize that the wedding gift you buy for that deacon's daughter as her pastor is a legitimate business expense. Now, to get reimbursed from that by your church probably would <laughs> create a little bit of <laughs> problem. Oh, he gets reimbursed for the wedding gifts? He buys my daughter? Probably not smart. But that's how far it goes. And so my point is, whatever you spend involving the people of that church is a legitimate business expense because they are your customers according to the IRS tax law. So it's always good to sit down with your board and say, okay, what do you guys consider fair game here so that there's no misunderstanding, I don't want any problem with anybody, what is reimbursable to me for business expenses? Well, anytime you drive your car for church use, that's a business expense, reimburse it. The mileage rate this year is, this year is 36 cents a mile. Well, that's huge. Now, commuter mileage is never reimbursable. And we've just got a few minutes. Let me fire here. So how do you do business mileage? Let me show you real quick. Let's say this is a circumference where your church people live. This is your town. This is your church. This is your home. And this is where most of your people live. Anytime you go from home to the church, that's commuter. That's not business. Anytime you go from church to home, that's commuter. That's not business. So you get up in the morning, you go to church, personal. You come home after church, personal. That night you go from church to visitation. You go calling on people in your church. You go to home A, personal. You go to B, business. You go to C, business. You go to D, business. You go home, personal. Anytime you go from your home to a business stop or from the last business stop to your home, it's personal. Everything else is business. Now, this is where most of your people have live. Now you got somebody who lives out here. And you go from home to this person. Business. Why? Because it's not in your general business area. You go to, you go, this, this is your town. There's a town over here where the hospital's at. And you've got people in the hospital. You go from your home to visit those people in all business because it's not in your general business area. That's how it works. Yes? Circle. Just common sense. You just, you know, and IRS doesn't know it either. But a sharp IRS auditor that would be auditing you for business expenses, he would want to know where is your general business area, and then you tell him, you know, this is what it looks like. And but I got this person that lives way out here, and that's the tax law. If you go to the church and then you go from the church to A, B, C, then yeah. that's all business. Model. Sure. That's why you got some pastors who live here. And the church post office is here. They get up in the morning, they go to the post office, pick up the church mail. Now, anything from there is business. <laughs> That's the tax law. Now you got some guys that live out here. They choose to live here. The church is here. All commuter, because it's the pastor's choice to live here. IRS is not going to give you a deduction, even though you choose to live outside your business area. That's your responsibility. Yes? If you're a church given you a business expense allowance and then you were responsible to hold on to your receipt, is there a suggested amount of time that we should hold on to? 60 it? days. There's a 60 day rule. Okay. If, I, if our church gives you an allowance in January, 60 days after the end of January, you need to report to the church of what you did of that allowance. If you didn't spend it all, you got to refund it to the church. You can't apply it to the next allowances. Those six years. Six years. Okay. You give the church a copy of them. That's called accountable reimbursement plan. 
So if you're audited by the IRS and they say, boy, how many, how, I, there's, no, there's no expense deduction on your tax return. How did you handle your business expenses? Well, I was reimbursed by my church. Really, take me through the procedure. Let's say I'm an auditor. And you take me through the procedure. And let's say you were reimbursed for about 4,000 bucks this year because of professional expenses. And I'd say to you, great, who's got the receipts? Oh, I got them. What do you mean you got them? Well, I got them. You mean your, your treasurer doesn't have them? No, no, I keep them. I got you. The whole 4,000 is taxable because you're, you're dealing with a non-accountable reimbursement program. The treasurer has to have the receipts. You can keep copies, but he has to have research, receipts. That's called accountable. Yes? I thought it was uh, three years that he had to keep receipts. You can be audited for three years. You need to keep receipts for six years because if a guy is audited and he underreported income in excess of 25% of his income, they can go back six years. So I recommend you keep it six years. 403B pension plans, we talked about that. Page six is how you set up the, the professional expense plan at your church. <clears throat> Page seven, and I'm sorry we're about out of time, but this is the stuff. Guys, let me tell you about designating gifts to your church. Real quickly, just because this is an important one. Can I give a gift to, to my church and designate it to an individual and get a tax deductible receipt? No. No. Now, are there exceptions? Yes, I can give a gift to my church and designate it to a missionary and get a receipt because that missionary pays tax on it. I can even designate a gift to my church and designate it for a pastor and get a receipt because that pastor pays tax on it. It's assumed the board controls that gift. Can I give a gift to the church for a needy family and get a receipt? No. Can I give a receipt? Can I give a gift to my church and designate it to an individual going to Master Seminary and get a receipt? No. Absolutely not. Can I give a gift to my church and designate it to the scholarship fund and get a receipt? Yes. Can I give a gift to my church and designate it to the, uh, to the um, benevolence fund and get a receipt? Yes. What's the difference? I, the giver, am not designating who gets it. That's prohibited in tax law. Now, guys, the issue in churches with finances is always squeaky clean. The church must model integrity to our culture. And you always model integrity to your people. You don't ever bend the rules. Don't ever do that. Once you compromise yourself, you are compromised. And you don't want to go there. You do not want to go there. I even take it this far. Can I go to my church and give a gift to my church and say, you know, I really would appreciate if you'd use this $1,000 to help the Smith family. Now, I didn't tell you to help the Smith family. I suggested, hey, listen, that's stronger than a suggestion. Because chances are between Slim and none and Slim died that you're not going to use that $1,000 to help the Smith family. And you know that. So you say, no, I can't do that. You've got to give this gift totally with no strings attached. And chances are it will not go to the Smith family. Because otherwise, they get to the water cooler. And everybody's gathered around the water cooler. And someone says, you know, I can't designate gifts to my church. Oh, I can do it at my church. My, pa my pastor does it all the time. You've compromised your integrity. You do not go there. It's called squeaky clean. Yes? It seems as though you obviously don't support um, opting out of Social Security. No, I do not. My 25 years, I've never counseled a pastor to opt out. We take this position. There is no biblical support for opting out of Social Security. It's conscientious objection for religious conviction reasons only. Has never been a financial issue. Always a conscientious objection issue for religious conviction reasons. Guys, we're not conscientious objectors. So I don't recommend pastors opt out. I don't even think it's a good financial decision. It's not a financial decision. I think it's a poor financial decision because pastors who opt out don't replace it. They don't replace it. What about Medicare, Medicaid, all of that? Five years after you opt out, you have forfeited any disability benefits even though you may have your 10 years in because of other employment. You get Social Security benefits if you have 40 quarters or 10 years, but you will not get, you, you will not get disability benefits from Social Security. You forfeited that. Pastors will say to me, well, you know, I've got my 40 quarters in. I got my 10 years because I worked in business before I went to seminary and pastored a church. So I can opt out because I'm going to get some benefits. And I'll say, you're really not an objector, are you? You're very grateful you're getting those benefits. 
Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, you're not an objector. So guys, before you sign 4361, make sure you read that thing really carefully and you understand what you're signing. It's a perjury issue if you don't sign it for those reasons. Yes? Is it true that it is uh, religious as well as economic reasons? It is what? Religious as well as economic. It could be economic reasons also for opting out. Never. It's never been an economic decision. Always a religious reason for conscientious objection. Conscious objection for religious conviction reasons only. Only. Never been an economic decision. Never has been. Now, some of you guys have probably opted out. I'm not trying to put you on a guilt trip because I think you probably got bad counsel. You're out. You're out. They opened the window to get back in. They did open the window. They just closed April 15th of last year, but you could have gotten back in. I recommend you get back in if you get an opportunity. As a student, none of this really applies to us until we have a license to begin as a pastor. Right. Is, there any, is there any keys that we should take away as a student during our seminary training that we should keep up with or just know that? Well, you still have a responsibility to file your taxes. You don't get the pastoral benefits. So there's no really pastoral benefits except the lifetime learning credit. You'll get that as long as you're spending money to go to seminary. That can be big on your tax return for income tax purposes. So you do get that. Other than that, no, there's not, no, not, not as a pastor, no. All right, we do want to talk today about the issue of how you should treat your employees. In a church, when you look at your church budget, some of you, just out of curiosity, how many of you currently are involved in pastoral, paid pastoral ministry in a church? See your hands. When you look at your budget, or if you look at the church's budget as a whole particularly, it's amazing how large a percentage of your annual expenditures are people. People make up the life of the church. And when you look at Grace Church's budget, it's the same way. A very large percentage of our annual expenditures go to caring for the people who serve here. So it's very important that we do it right. I've mentioned this survey before, but let me just allude to it in a little more detail. In October of, of 1999, the Master's Seminary sent out a survey to 69 seminary graduates and to the appropriate lay leaders in each church. The response sampling was about 17%. On a four-point scale, there were no failing marks in all of the areas they asked these churches to rate the Master Seminary graduates. There was an overall rating of 3.47, which some of you would love to have. 93% um, of the responses were outstanding or excellent. The highest scores that these churches, these lay leaders, gave the seminary graduates were in these categories. A biblical philosophy of ministry, out of, on a four-point scale, 3.78. Loving and responsible husband and father, 3.75. Teaches theological truth, 3.73. The lowest score, you ready for this, was in the category called Shepherdly compassion. Now, man, I have to tell you, that is a shame. That's a shame. You haven't learned to be a pastor if you haven't learned to care for people. And that starts with the people that God has most directly called you to shepherd, and that is your staff. I'll tell you, anecdotally, it's not uncommon. In fact, I can think of a specific incident in the not too distant past, where I met with some elders from another church, they were telling me that they had fired their pastor. And when I asked a little bit of the background as to why these elders had let their pastor go, their response was that they had fired him for his harsh, condescending interaction with the staff. It wasn't even so much the members. It was with the staff. His harsh, condescending interaction with the paid staff of the church. 
What's the motivation you and I have for caring for those people that God has given us as a staff? Let's look at a couple of verses together. Colossians 4.1 In talking about servants and masters, and we understand that that's not a strict parallel. Obviously, your staff hopefully aren't your slaves. But the, the appropriate application is there that if you're in a position of authority over someone else and they work for you, the, the point is the same. And Paul, in urging masters to treat their servants correctly, says this, Do it knowing that you too have a master in heaven. And in, Col in Ephesians 6, 9, same context, parallel passage basically in, to the Ephesians, where he's talking to masters, he says, you know, treat your servants, those who work for you or alongside you, treat them right because knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, ooh, and this is a hard one, and there is no partiality with him. God doesn't give you, an, you know, sort of a, a get out of jail free card because you're in a position of authority. Paul says, you better treat these people that work under you, under your authority, right, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven. And he isn't partial. He doesn't care what title you have. He doesn't care what position of authority you have. He expects you to treat them the way you ought to treat them. Now look at these two passages, and what I want you to see this is this. The essential message of these two passages is the same. You both have the same master. What does that say about your real relationship to those who are working under you? If you both have the same master, then what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, you're basically equal. Yes, God for his own purposes has, has put you in a position of leadership, but you're essentially equal under one common master. And there may be divinely established authority, but don't let that go to your head. You too have a master in heaven. And in fact, as he says in Ephesians 6, it's the same master. So, with that in mind, what are elders' biblical responsibilities to the church employees? Well, I want to look at these two passages in a little more detail. Turn to Colossians 4.1. Let's look at it for just a moment. The scripture characterizes our interaction with servants. And again, that's those whom you are over in authority and whose work you direct. And so it's an, it's an adequate parallel to staff, church staff. He says in Colossians 4, verse 1, Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness. Justice and fairness. The word fairness, by the way, just means equity or impartiality. In other words, don't be a respecter of persons with your staff. I'll tell you where this is a real temptation. Those who have a seminary education and those who don't. Paul's saying, listen, you treat those who serve alongside you with justice and fairness. You don't be swayed to be, to be partial based on some sort of criteria in these people. Now, that's pretty straightforward. Look at Ephesians, though. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9, the parallel passage. And masters, do the same things to them. That refers back to the commands to slaves in verses 5 through 8. He's saying, basically, what I've told slaves to do, you do. With the exception, of course, of being obedient to those who are your masters. But as far as serving Christ, and whatever you do, do it not as men-pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, attempting to do the will of God from the heart, with good will render service as to the Lord and not to men, with a perspective that the key thing here is your master, your common master, is going to decide whether your, whether your service was what ought to have been or not. Do the same things to them. So you, in a position of leadership, have the same attitude that he's encouraging slaves to have. And then he adds this. And give up threatening. 
It's a very interesting phrase. He includes in the Greek the definite article before threatening. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, give up the system of motivating people by intimidation, threats, or harshness. Let me say that again. When he says, give up literally the threatening, he's saying, give up the entire system of motivating people by intimidation, threats, or harshness. Don't even think about that. That isn't how you motivate people. That isn't how you stir people to action. You want to see how you should do it in more detail, you turn to 1 Peter 5, and there he makes it clear. Your service ought to be that of being an example of leading, not of driving. I'm not going to take a lot of time with this, but I would encourage you to do something as you have opportunity. If you want to know what the kinds of sins leaders are tempted to with those who serve under them, and you want to know what your responsibilities biblically are toward those who serve under you, get the Westminster Confession of Faith. I don't agree with everything in the Westminster Confession of Faith, namely the es eschatology, but there are a lot of very solid things there. And Go specifically to the section on the Ten Commandments, on the law of God, and they get, they get to the interpretation of the Ten Commandments. They get to the Fifth Commandment. Most, of, most people believe that the Fifth Commandment is simply the way it's stated, honor your father and mother, and that's all it includes. I don't want to get into the whole deal here, but I will tell you this. The Ten Commandments are a summary, they're an outline of God's law, God's moral law that reflects his character. Christ summarized it as love, your, love the Lord your God and love your neighbors yourself. The Ten Commandments are an outline of it, if you will. Each one of those commandments was intended to serve as a hook on which all related commandments hang. So for example, you have one commandment about sexual sin. Is adultery the only sexual sin God forbids? Of course not. That is simply a hook on which to hang all of the commandments about sexual purity, both negative ones and positive ones. The same thing is true when you come to the fifth commandment. Honor your father and your mother. Are you just supposed to honor your father and your mother? No, of course not. That is a summary of a category of life in which God has given commandments. And that is the issue of authority. How we are supposed to respond to authority. Father and mother is one form of authority. Government is another form of authority. Those who are our elders in age is one form of authority. Those who are our elders in terms of the church office, that's another form of authority. All that fifth commandment does is summarize an entire category of God's law, and that is our relationship positively and negatively to authority. It was in a... In a a society where they didn't have a written scripture in their hands. It was a device, I believe, to enable them to remember the categories in which God had issued commandments. And what the Westminster Confession does when it gets to that fifth commandment is it says, okay, with that understanding, then let's look at the scripture passages that deal with how a superior sins against those under him and under his authority. And let's look at the passages where he uh, does what he ought to do, where he reflects the right kind of responsibility toward those who are under him. And they have this extensive list. You won't agree with all the references that are cited, but the list itself is really quite compelling. I'm not going to spend any time here. Let me just read you a few samples. And again, I would encourage you to look at it and study it more. The commands of superiors, according to that power they receive from God, Confession says, is to the following to love them, to pray for them, to bless them, to instruct them, to counsel and admonish them, to countenance, commend, and reward those who do well, to discountenance, reprove, and chasten those who do ill, they say, to protect them, to provide for them all things necessary for soul and body, with the results to procure glory to God, honor to themselves, and to preserve that authority which God has put upon them. 
Those are the positive requirements you and I have in positions of authority. What are the sins? The sins of superiors, as the confession calls it. Superior not in quality, but in position. Neglect of those duties, that's the first one. Inordinate seeking of themselves, their own glory, ease, profit, or pleasure. In other words, using your position for yourself. Commanding things unlawful. In other words, telling somebody in your care to do something that is against the Scripture, what God has required them to do. Commanding things not in the power of inferiors to perform. Counseling, encouraging, or favoring them in that which is evil dissuading, discouraging, or discountenancing them in that which is good, correcting them unduly, carelessly exposing or leaving them to wrong temptation and danger, provoking them to wrath, in any way dishonoring themselves or lessening their authority by any unjust, indiscreet, rigorous, or remiss behavior. End quote. There you go. There's a summary of your duty as someone in leadership. Now, obviously, I want you to investigate those because that's at the heart. That forms the attitude or the foundation from which the practical things I'm going to talk about come. But I'm going to spend my time today, because it's the nature of this class, focusing on the practical side of how that attitude manifests itself. What are some specific ways to care for your employees? At Grace Church, I, in conjunction with the treasurer of the board, and the HR staff make recommendations about how we can properly care for our employees to the lay elders. And I make it not to the full board because obviously they're those who are staff elders. Uh, as I mentioned, I think I mentioned this to you before, the staff elders stay out of discussions and decisions about remuneration, benefits, and all of that because obviously it's to our benefit and so we can't be truly detached in making that decision and, and appear to be objective and so we leave those decisions about those things to the lay elders. So I, I talk to the treasurer of the board, I talk to our HR staff and we come up with ways that we feel are right to treat our employees. Let me go through them. The first one that you need to do if you're going to care for your people is timely adequate pay. Those are two very important words. Timely, adequate pay. You want to treat your employees right? That's where it starts. Timely, adequate pay. We've looked at this verse before, but just flip there for a moment to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Verse 17. The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor talking about pay, not necessarily twice or two times as much, but be especially generous. And then there are two quotations, one from Deuteronomy 25.4 and the other from Luke 10.7. By the way, this is a great passage to prove that the New Testament writers thought of the New Testament as Scripture because Paul says, for the Scripture says, and then he quotes Deuteronomy, and then he quotes Luke. Anyway, you can file that one away. But the point is, in both of these verses that are quoted, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. He's using those verses to prove. Notice how verse 18 begins. For, because, this is proof of why the elders who serve well are worthy of double honor. So we're obviously talking about financial remuneration. Now, it, that's certainly true with elders. It's also true for any staff who serve faithfully. Any staff who you have the responsibility to care for. I have to tell you, it is absolutely embarrassing and pathetic what many churches pay their staffs. Uh, I won't cite any specific examples, but I have asked on occasion pastors, when, they're, when they tell me they're struggling financially, I'll ask them what they're paid. And frankly, it is embarrassing to the church. There are pastors who literally could collect food stamps. Now, I'm not talking about if there's a church that just can't afford to support a pastor. That's different. That happens, and men have to work full-time jobs, and, and pastor on the weekends, that, that happens. 
I'm talking about when a church has the means to do it and they decide instead to take that money and do something else with it. That's wrong. Better for them to pay their people well and have a rented facility than to be in the Taj Mahal and pay their people like paupers. And it happens. I'm intimately acquainted with a, pla with a place that all the exterior, you look at the, their, their plant, their facilities, you look at all that they have, and you think this place is amazing. The money they spend on their, their landscaping alone is incredible. But I talked to several people who work there, and it's embarrassing what they pay their people. It's slave labor. The scripture says that's not the way it's supposed to be. Let me tell you, at Grace Church, John MacArthur is always the one who's arguing the loudest for employees to have additional pay. Not him. He always refuses to take raises. We have to force him at times, although he can't always be forced. But he's the one clamoring for the employees to be paid a decent wage, more than they're paid. And guess what? When you're a senior pastor, that becomes your chief responsibility to care for these people and to make sure they're paid like they ought to be paid. It ought to be timely. And I'm not going to look at the passages, but you're familiar with them. They'll be in your notes that you'll get at the end of the semester on the Internet. Leviticus 19.13, Jeremiah 22.13, and James 5.4. The principle that there are people who, in the case of those passages, who were day laborers, who were expecting pay at the end of the day, and that was the only basis on which they'd be able to get food for their families for the evening meal and for the next day. And those passages make it clear that you better not withhold those, that guy's salary because his family's depending on that. And let me just say, let me just make a little footnote here. There are times when churches get into problems. They get overcommitted. They get too much debt. Or maybe they just hit a hard time. You know, the country's, the economy goes in the tank, whatever happens, and they end up having to make a choice. And that is they... They, there are companies that they need to pay, outside vendors, if you will, print shops or whatever, Kinko's who printed their church bulletin, or their staff. Now you tell me, what are you going to do in that situation? A lot of people reason this way. Well, you know, our testimony with outsiders and our reputation in the community, we've got to pay Kinko's. Well, it's true, you do. But guess what? God says you better not withhold. You read those passages. They're pretty... They're pretty uh, straightforward. You better not withhold the wages from the man who's earned them. What I would do in that case is I'd go meet with Kinko's. I'd explain my situation, tell them I have to pay the staff, and work out a plan that's acceptable with them so that you've retained your testimony with both and you've fulfilled your obligation. But you owe your employees adequate, timely pay. Yes, sir. That's that's a good question, and I'm going to get there in just a second. Um, in fact, let's go there now. The question basically is, um, for those of you who may not have heard it, how do you go about establishing what's adequate? I know it may be in your heart to do that. How do you get there? Well, let me give you a couple of places you can go. There are a couple of sources that we use at Grace Church, and these aren't the only ones. There are others. But you can go to um, Stephen Langer, Abbott Langer and Associates. They have a, a publication called Compensation in Nonprofit Organizations. There's a website. This information, again, is in your, in your syllabus. You'll get at the end of the semester. But you can get a, a salary survey from them, which will allow you to see what nonprofit organizations and um, pay for various positions, secretarial help, so forth. There's another one, the 2001 compensation, well obviously now it'd be 2002, the 2003 won't be out until the end of the year, but um, the compensation handbook, I should leave that year blank just because it changes each year, but it's uh, for church staff, it's by basically Richard Hammer, you know that book that I suggested as one you may want to have in your library on legal issues? Same people. 
and he has a website. In fact, here it is, phone number and website. Again, this will be in your notes. But this, these are sources where you can gain information about what other churches pay. I forget now which of these, but one of these is even broken down by region. So, for example, a guy pastoring in Los Angeles is going to need a little higher salary than a guy pastoring in you know, the Midwest and outside of big cities in a rural area in the Midwest. And so it's broken down that way even. So you can look at what churches, and one of them is broken down by size of the church. Churches over, over 1,000, churches 500 to 1,000, churches 300 to 500, you know, and so forth. So you can get a little feel in the different categories what, uh, what's paid. For example, here are a couple that, that I pulled just as a sample for you. When you look at uh, senior pastor, for example, senior pastor based on attendance. This includes base salary, housing allowance, retirement contribution, life and health insurance policy, and educational funds. So it's the whole package, in other words. First of all, based on attendance, over a thousand members, the average was 86,000 for a senior pastor. Based on annual budget, if the budget was over a million, so these are large churches, um, 85,000 was the average, and the top was 162. Based on setting, urban, that is in the middle of the city, the average was 102 and the high was 207. So you get a little idea of what other churches are paying and you begin. That doesn't mean you have to do it. It just gives you a framework to see if you're way too low or you're way too high. And you want to avoid both of those extremes. Too low, obviously, and you're robbing people of what they really ought to be making. And too high, and you're putting your, your staff in a position where the government begins to say a nonprofit is, is uh, unfairly, uh, overly compensating their employees. And you begin to open yourself up to questions from the IRS. Here are, um, these are basically associate pastors. In other words, at Grace Church, they would be at our, at our um, division head level. And these are from the surveys, including all of those things, the whole package, associate pastor, based on a church, based on attendance, over 1,000. The average is 54. The high is 92. Based on annual budget, over a million. Average is 50, 55. The, the high is 88. Based on setting urban, the average is 62. The high is 92. So, and, and then you have uh, my position and so forth. But that's what I'm saying is you can break it down by position and also you can do it by other categories which help you sort of decide. Uh, and it goes not through pastoral staff only but through receptionists, secretaries, the whole package. Yes, sir? Are those numbers really, should we consider those to be low though since you said most churches pay low? No, because these, frankly, are these are in the West in very large churches. These would be on the higher end of churches. What what when you look at a given survey and you're looking in that area, then you're seeing a pretty good reflection. But you do need to look at what churches are participating. That makes a difference too. I mean, a lot of real small, independent with a big eye churches won't participate in a survey like that, and so they their salaries may be a lot lower than a church that'd be willing to give their information to a survey like this. So you have to look at who's involved and sort of sort all that through. Again, it just provides a framework so that your elders, as you're looking at it, can make a, an informed decision rather than just sort of, well, what do, we, what do you think we ought to pay this guy? Which is unfortunately often how it happens. We do this, by the way, when we're establishing new salaries, when we're talking about raises, I ask, our HR department to pull together salary surveys on positions and we want to make sure that we're still within the, the reasonable range. Not grossly overpaying, way out of the, busting out the scale, nor do we want to be on the low end. We want to be on the upper end, middle to upper, but we don't want to blow out the scale either.
because we believe 1 Timothy 5. They ought to, they're worthy of double honor. They're worthy of being paid well. Yes, sir. Think about uh, or any comments regarding utilizing the unified school district from your local area as a guideline. Question is, what about utilizing the local school district as a guideline for setting salaries? I don't know that I would suggest that one specifically, but what we do, and in fact in these salary surveys that I have here, not only do we include from these two surveys, but we will pull from a secular environment. We'll say in our area, what's a similar secular job to this job? And then we'll look at secular salary surveys as well, just for point of comparison. So for example, um, a chief executive officer, if you're talking about a senior pastor, a large church, what's a chief executive officer of a middle-sized company typically make? Usually, obviously, we're not going to go to that extent. We just want to, we just want to know. We just want to be informed and make an informed decision. All right? Let's go um, ne next issue. Timely adequate pay is the first thing you owe your employees. The second is health insurance. Very important. Somebody have a guess as to what the average medical stay in a hospital, average being two to three days, costs. If you, were, if you received a bill and insurance covered nothing, what would your bill be for two days in a hospital? It would be somewhere between seventy-five and 100000 The low end would be 50000 50 to $100,000. There aren't many people that can afford that. And your staff at your church certainly will not be able to afford that. What about self-insurance, you say? Just have, them, just have them insure themselves. That's going to cost the average person for major medical, which just covers, I mean, the worst things. When you have to go in the hospital for surgery, that's $500 a month for an individual. It's very expensive. So you really do owe your employees health insurance because they can't afford to they can't afford to gamble on that and frankly neither can you if you don't have any health insurance you're frankly i think presuming on the lord and i would encourage you to do whatever you have to to get some insurance i think there's some available some ways to do it as a student because you just cannot assume that you're not going to need to go in the hospital and you're going to put yourself as a pastor into debt forever trying to pay off 50 to 100,000 dollars now, how do you go about as a church securing health insurance for your staff? Well, you can do self-research, which is extremely time-consuming, or you can contact a broker. A broker is simply someone who deals with health benefits. They can contact several different health um, care companies on your behalf based on your demographic, based on where you are, come back to you with quotes from several companies. That's what I would suggest to you. That's what we do here. If you want to find out in your area, you get to a church, call several other churches. Ask them if they have an agent that they found to be especially helpful. Ask them very specific questions. You know, have you had any problems? What are the problems? How long have you had them? And maybe you'll, you'll find a broker in the area that's good. Or there may be somebody in your church who has expertise in that field who can direct you to the right person. Just make sure you do due diligence and you don't just go with somebody in the church because they're in the church because you want your employees to have what they need the best. Now, what are the possible health care plans? Basically, there are three of them. First of all, a POS, which stands for point of service. You choose the doctor you want, and insurance reimburses them. I can tell you now your church will not have this because it's very expensive. PPO is where there is a list of approved physicians and you can go to any of those approved physicians that are on the list. You don't have a primary physician that you have to go through. Instead, you look at the list of approved physicians and say, I want to go to this one, and you can go. That one is a little more reasonable, but it's still costly. I'll give you a cost comparison in a second. The third is HMO, and that stands, of course, for Health Maintenance Organization. This is where you choose the doctor you will visit from a list of doctors, and you can't go to any other doctor in the plan, even in the plan, without a referral. So it, you have a primary care doctor you select, and he's sort of the, he or she is the funnel to get you any other care you need. You have to go to them first. And the reason these can be, and this is what you'll probably end up with in today's climate, by the way. 
as much problem as HMOs can be, they're still the most helpful thing out there. There are a lot of, you've probably heard some of the jokes going around about HMOs. You know, what's the difference between an HMO and the PLO? <laughs> you can negotiate with the PLO. It, it's, unfortunately, there's a lot of truth to that, but it's still the most affordable health care. It still is, you can get good doctors. For example, we have an HMO that I'm a part of here at the church. I think most of you know that I have a eye glaucoma. I've had surgery to my right eye. I've had, oh, 100 laser shots to my left eye, about 150 to my right eye. And I have to maintain care for my eyes constantly. And I've been able to get a referral through the HMO to, frankly, the best doctor in the country on this issue at UCLA. And so through an HMO, you can still get good health care. You have to be diligent. You have to do a little more research. And you have to find out what doctors are, are good because you're going to get a collection. But you can still get good care. So I have nothing to complain about with our HMO. And um, that's what you'll probably end up with. Now, let me give you a, a little feel for the cost to the church of this. I didn't get one for this year. This is last year. It'll be close enough. Uh, actually, our costs didn't go up. We changed companies, and so our costs stayed constant this year. But last year, when we asked them to give us a, a, a do some research, we said to our broker, and you basically end up having to do this every year, okay, our health insurance company wants to raise, us, raise our rates 7, 10, 13 percent. Find out if there's a better choice. And so this is the result of that. And here's, here's a breakdown, just to give you an idea. If you want to pay for an HMO for just the employee, which you don't want to do, but let's say it's a single employee, so you've got, uh, you've got one person, that's a basically $180 a month that your church will pay for that person's insurance. So you put on top of whatever you're paying them, $180 a month, if it's only one person. If it's a family, well, let me, let me stop. If it's a, a, an employee and a spouse, employee plus one, it's about $350 a month for that employee's family to be covered with health insurance. If it's an employee plus the family, there are children involved, it's over $500 dollars a month that you will pay. So do the math. You're going to pay for health insurance for an employee. Uh, if they have a family, you're going to pay. Now, it may vary in areas of the country. I'm telling you what they are here. Um, you're going to pay $6,000 a year just in health insurance for an employee. But it's crucial because there's no way they're going to be cared for if you don't care for them. And you and I have that responsibility as elders to care for the people under our care. All right, so care for your employees with timely, adequate pay, health insurance, and retirement. Yes, sir. Have you ever evaluated a Christian Care Matters here type thing? Share matter the matters? question is, have we, in, have we evaluated any of the sort of um, share type arrangements? Basically, where a lot of Christian organizations go together, they pool their own resources and sort of create their own sort of insurance company. Uh, frankly, we've steered clear of those because... Are there one or two that function well? Probably, but it's a risk. If you start looking at how it's structured, um, and there are some who've gone belly up, and the care has been woefully inadequate. And so we as a church have just made the decision that that's not something we want to, that's not a business we want to get into. So we just as soon pay a company to, to handle it. If you can't afford to do what I'm talking about, you want to investigate that, feel free to do it. I personally would, would discourage you from it because of the horror stories I've heard. That doesn't mean there isn't one or two companies out there somewhere that are doing a good job of it. But it, I would encourage you to talk to a lot of people who have been in it a while before you consider anything like that. Because I think you'll find that it, it sounds good on the surface, but it doesn't always deliver. All right, retirement. Why is it important that the church care about this, that you care about your employees in this way? First of all, because of retirement income needs. You want to do a little interesting study, go to the Social Security Administration website 
and figure up what you will need in annual pay for an adequate retirement. Now, I don't believe in full retirement personally. I have no desire to be fully retired at 65 and sort of sitting on the porch watching my wife's varicose veins grow. <laughs> you know, I, that, that doesn't interest me at all. But I may reach, reach a stage in life when I don't have either the energy or the health to work full time. And I have to think about that. And I have to plan for that. And so do you. Go to the Social Security Administration website, or better yet, go to the Southern Baptist Annuity Board's website. You can reach them through the main Southern Baptist uh, website, Southern Baptist Convention website, and you can go there and calculate, based on your age and what your, your needs are now and so forth, you can calculate what you'll need for retirement. It's a lot more than you have set aside, let me just say that. So, because of the needs, we need to take care of this. Also because most people don't save for their own retirement. It's quite amazing actually. Most people are upside down financially. In fact, I'll just throw this out for good measure. I read a book one time, not that I don't recommend this book, it wasn't that helpful, but it had a couple of interesting facts in it called The Millionaire Next Door. It was a bestseller in the New York Times list. It was making a very interesting point though, and that is that our society is all appearance and no substance because 80% of the people who drive Mercedes, 80% of the people who drive Mercedes are financially upside down. That means they have a negative net worth. They owe more than they have in assets. They're making a lot of money. Maybe they're making a couple hundred thousand a year, but they're spending everything they get. The real millionaire is the guy who drives a 10-year-old you know, American-made car. That's what the survey found. They surveyed like 1,400 millionaires, true millionaires in the country, and discovered that the profile is a lot different than you think. But most people don't save. They spend what they get. Also, it's important to reward those who faithfully serve through the years. And frankly, I think it's the issue of adequately providing for those who are in your charge. Now, how do you go about setting up retirement? Well, there are two basic vehicles that you can use um, or I should say there's one basic vehicle. We'll talk about the ways you can, you can sort of break that vehicle down. It's the 403B plan. It's the equivalent to the 401K, which you've heard about in the, in the normal for-profit business. These numbers come out of the IRS code, and it simply describes a vehicle that can be set aside that's tax-deferred toward which a person and his company can contribute, and uh, then you take it out on retirement. Now, what vehicles specifically can you use to, for these 403B plans? The most common options are an annuity. This is an insurance company vehicle. Basically, there is no risk and consequently a very low return. In today's world, these are looking better and better. Um, because there, there's no risk involved in them, you are going to get your retirement money and a small return. Stock market investments is another, a variety of mutual and bond funds from which the employee selects. You come up with a list uh, along with your, your broker again, a, retire, a benefit specialist who helps you know what you can and can't offer legally. And you do have to offer a variety so that you're doing your fiduciary responsibility to give this person something that's maybe a little more aggressive and has more risk on it, and on the other end, something that's ultra-conservative and isn't going isn't to lose their money. So they have a wide variety of things from which to choose. Maybe you only have to offer three, four, or five options for them, but then they choose, and they can usually, for example, the church, we're in the TIAA-CREF fund here at the church, connected with the college, and... Um, in that, we have a, a selection of funds from which we can choose to contribute toward. Now, how are these funded? How is a retirement plan funded? Well, there are several ways. First are employee contributions only. And there's some organizations, this is all they can do. They basically set up the plan, and if you want to give toward it, you give toward it. And that's helpful because at least the person can deduct, have it deducted from their paycheck and it just makes it simpler for them to do this as a discipline. But uh, it's not helping them a great deal because most people won't do that. 
organization con contributions only. These are your pension type plans. These are basically becoming obsolete because of the cost involved to organizations. And the third is much more popular and that is matching contributions where the church matches the employee's contribution up to a certain percentage and there, that percentage changes or there's a, actually a dollar amount I think uh, up to 11,000, somewhere around 10, 11,000 now I think a year that you can contribute toward this 403B plan and the church can match or the organization can match. Um, there are rules regarding fair structure of how this can be set up to avoid unfair compensation of highest paid employees. So you have to do it so that everyone's adequately uh, paid, adequately covered. At Grace Church, this is what we have, is a, con a matching contribution plan where we can contribute to a variety of stock market all the way down to an annuity fund that's real ultra conservative. And we can divide up our money however we want that we contribute by percentage basically. So I want 40% of my money to go here, and I want 30% to go here, and I want, you know, so forth. And the church matches my contribution dollar for dollar up to 6% of my annual income. So in other words, um, if I give a dollar, the church gives a dollar. If I give up to 6% of my annual income, then the church matches that, that same amount. It's a great encouragement to, to save toward retirement and it's money that's set aside. They can get some loans against it and other things but you, you have to help counsel them not to do that or to do that only in the case of necessity and to really start planning for the future. The eligibility, um, before I go to this, let me just say on these retirement plans, the eligibility at Grace Church uh, usually involves a couple of things. For us, it involves length of employment. You have to be here two years before the church will match. You can contribute up to, uh, the, from the day you start, up to two years, your own contributions. But once you reach two years, then the church begins to match dollar for dollar up to 6%. Also, your work status. We only do this for employees over 32 hours, and that means full-time employees. If you work more than 32 hours, you're considered full-time. Now, other miscellaneous benefits that I'll just mention, you need to have short-term and long-term disability insurance. Um, you have no idea who might get hurt and might not be able to continue to fulfill their role. We have people in our, in our um, special ministries who were jogging. I'm thinking of one man who was jogging, fell off the curb. I mean, this man was in great shape. Somehow his foot slipped off the curb, he hit his head, and he's in a wheelchair. You see him every Sunday. You have no idea what could happen in God's providence to your employees. You need to provide insurance that cares for them and their family in the event they lose the capacity to work. Term life insurance is fairly common. In other words, you buy a small policy, somewhere between ten and 50000 that is for that employee that will help them cover their funeral expenses. Do you know the average cost of funerals in today's world is ten to fifteen thousand dollars. If you don't have at least that much life insurance then you've created a serious problem for your family. Dental insurance is another um, benefit you can, you can carry that's helpful. We do that. That can be a very big expense for employees and of course you want to give them vacation as well. That's a great benefit. They need time away. And if I had more time, I would tell you the, the benefit I've seen in that. People come back from vacation when they take it refreshed and they're more productive than if they just kind of skip their vacation and work constantly. We all need that time to get away and be refreshed. And then finally, you can add vision benefits as well. We have a, a plan to provide glasses and that, those kinds of things here at the church.